Let us sing to God's praise and glory hymn 200, Christ is made the sure foundation. Good morning. On behalf of the congregation, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Reverend Jeanette Whitecross, who will be leading our service this morning. We hope you enjoy your time with us. Thank you. Uh, I hope everyone's got a copy of the intimations. There are quite a lot. Um, Tea and coffee is available after the service, and Linda is still looking for some more volunteers to help with that. The coffee shop's on on Tuesday morning, the bowling club on Monday afternoon, and the warm space on Thursday afternoon. And to enable us to replace items in the kitchen, we'll be holding a fundraising lunch on the first Sunday of each month, and tea and coffee will be available as usual. There's a list of items that are needed for the food bank, the BB dedication service will be on Sunday, 29th of October, when they will be celebrating the 140th anniversary of the Boys' Brigade. They would like to share the celebration with the, our BB family, former members, staff, our Queen's men, and their families. And there's an invitation to join after the service with their soup and sweet lunch. The 
anchor boys, thank you for bringing in the empty toilet rolls, and they've got enough after today. <laughs> and pastoral cover up until the 17th is provided by Reverend Brian Henry. Thank you to all who donated to the Christian Aid Libya appeal. The amount raised was £482. Christmas Fair quiz suites are available from Linda Telfer or Dorothy Jack, and they must be returned by the 19th of November. Donations are required for the Christmas Fair. If you have any new or unneeded gifts, please place them in the, Christ in the Christmas box, and the church secretary will be on holiday from the 16th to the 20th of October. The office will be unmanned during this time. And two that are not printed. Iris Edgar, who was in Station 12 in Air Hospital last week, has moved to Templeton House in Racecourse Road. She would love for friends to visit her there. Her home address was Garton at Sundrum. And the youth church will not meet next week. Okay. Thank you very much. We come from scattered homes to this sanctuary to worship God and to praise his holy name. And we're going to sing, As we are gathered, Jesus is here. Now I'm going to have a wee word with the young people and even the not so young people. Any, would you like to come out and help me? It's, it's dead easy. No? Would you like to come out and help me? No? Well, the big children will need to help. Okay. I wonder if you're out to play or anything, can you stand on one foot? Can you? Let me see. Can you stand on one foot? Oh, she's doing it just now. Excellent. Can you shut your eyes? Can you shut your eyes? Yes. Open them up again. Can you clap your hands? Well done. I want you to put your finger up like this. Everybody can put their pointing finger up straight and then slowly bend it right down. And do you know... To bend your finger down like that, it uses one, two knuckles, and it uses muscles inside, and there are bones in there too. And even inside our bodies, we've got bits and pieces that help us to do that too. To do that simple thing, move your finger. Your brain has to send messages to your finger to do that, you think, I'm going to move my finger. 
and it sends messages to the finger to move. And inside, there are tissues like muscles and tendons and bone and all sorts of things that help your body work. And inside, we've got blood. The heart pumps round to circulate our body and take oxygen and nutrients to our our brain and all our organs. And if we didn't have all these things working together, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be alive. We depend on all these things in our body working to make us do things and speak and see. And you see, that's what the church is like. The church is a body. It's not a building. The church is a body of people. And wherever they're gathered, they're part of Christ's body, the church. And he depends on us doing our bit to help him. How do you think we could help him? Do you know? Any ideas? Well, you could be helpful, couldn't you? Yeah, could you be helpful? Can you smile? (laughs) You can giggle, yeah. Well, if you smile... You can make people feel a wee bit happier, can't you? You could perhaps keep the door open for someone to let them pass. And all these little bits are helping in our worship. And we can sing our hymns and be here with your parents and your grandparents and all your family to worship God. And that's the important thing. We come to church as Christ's body and he depends on every single one of us playing our part. That is what the church is. And so we're going to sing another hymn. I think. Check my order of service. Yes. The church is wherever God's people are praising. Live lives worthy of the God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-powerful God, we offer you our praise and thanksgiving for this gift of life and all the rich resources of the world that sustain us. 
We sometimes take our freedom, our homes, food, fuel, and water for granted. Likewise, we often forget to thank you for the companionship of family and friends. Most of all, we appreciate that you care for us as your children. You teach us to be kind, loving, fair, and trustworthy. Yet, sometimes we fall far short of the mark. We can be feeble in our efforts to serve you and weak-hearted, giving in to temptation to do wrong or waste our time. Sometimes we deliberately ignore the tasks that need to be completed or stand back and let others do all the work. It is easy for us to make excuses, blaming other commitments, our health, our dependence, or our lack of experience. Lord God, we are sorry. Forgive us for all our feelings and faults. You know the embarrassing truth we hide. Help us to be honest with you and each other, always ready and willing to play our part in your church. Through good times and difficult times, may we shine as examples of your teaching in our daily lives, encouraging others to commit themselves to the faith and pass on your teaching to future generations. These things we ask in your Son, Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We're now going to hear the gospel readings. Our first reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 to 31a. Both readings are from the Good News Translation. One body with many parts. Christ is like a single body which has many parts. It is still one body, even though it is made up of different parts. In the same way, all of us, whether Jews or Gentiles, whether slaves or free, have been baptized into the one body by the same Spirit, and we have all been given the one Spirit to drink. For the body itself is not made up of only one part, but of many parts. If the foot were to say, because I am not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not keep it from being a part of the body. And if the ear were to say, because I am not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not keep it from being a part of the body. If the whole body were just an eye, how could it hear? And if it were only an ear, how could it smell? As it is, however, God put every different part in the body just as he wanted it to be. There would not be a body if it were all only one part. As it is, there are many parts, but one body. So then, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Nor can the head say to the feet, well, I don't need you. On the contrary, we cannot do without the parts of the body that seem to be weaker. And those parts that we think aren't worth very much are the ones which we treat with greater care. While the parts of the body which don't look very nice 
are treated with special modesty, which the more beautiful parts do not need. God himself has put the body together in such a way as to give greater honor to those parts that need it. And so there is no division in the body, but all its different parts have the same concern for one another. If one part of the body suffers, all the other parts suffer with it. If one part is praised, all the other parts share its happiness. All of you are Christ's body, and each one is a part of it. In the church, God has put all in place. In the first place, apostles. In the second place, prophets. And in the third place, teachers. Then those who perform miracles, followed by those who are given the power to heal or to help others or to direct them or to speak in strange tongues. They are not all apostles or prophets or teachers. Not everyone has the power to work miracles or to heal diseases or to speak in strange tongues or to explain what is said. Set your hearts then on the more important gifts. The second reading is from Luke chapter 4 verses 14 to 21. Jesus begins his work in Galilee. Then Jesus returned to Galilee, and the power of the Holy Spirit was with him. The news about him spread throughout all that territory. He taught in the synagogues and was praised by everyone. Then Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath, he went as usual to the synagogue. He stood up to read the scriptures and was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has chosen me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed and announce that the time has come when the Lord will save his people. Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. All the people in the synagogue had their eyes fixed on him as he said to them, this passage of scripture has come true today as you heard it being read. Amen. May God bless these readings of his word. Thank you. We sing, Be Thou My Vision.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Are you listening? Luke records Jesus' return to his homeland, his hometown, near the start of his ministry. There in Nazareth, amongst people he'd grown up beside, Jesus stood in his local synagogue and read from the prophet Isaiah. This wasn't unusual because all males were taught the ancient Hebrew scriptures for this purpose. Some would read from memory, not really understanding the words. Jesus read with meaning and purpose. He concluded by rolling up the scroll and sitting down. At this point, it was common to hear comments on the reading. But what Jesus said astounded his listeners. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. If anyone had been dozing or half-heartedly listening, this made them sit up and take notice. Jesus claimed there and then to have fulfilled God's prophecy. He brought the power of the ancient written word of Scripture to life, making it active then and even now. The great 20th century theologian Karl Barth likens the effect of hearing God speak to an experience he once had. While climbing up the stairs of a medi medieval cathedral tower in the dark, he put out his hand to grasp the stair rope to steady himself and was amazed to hear a bell ring out above him so that the whole community below could hear. He had inadvertently pulled the bell rope and the noise resounded everywhere. Just as Jesus' words rang out in Nazareth, bringing the prophecy into the present tense, so they speak to us. The scriptures have the power to inspire us and fire our faith to do great things, just as they did in Jesus' day. The gospel speaks to us today. Are we listening? Max Lucado writes devotional material. Perhaps some of you have read some of his works. I find what he writes both meaningful and relevant to life today. He records a story about this question of whether we are listening to God. Once there was a God, once there was a man who dared God to speak. Burn the bush like you did for Moses, God, and I will follow. Collapse the walls like you did for Joshua, God, and I will fight. Still the waves like you did on Galilee, God and I will listen. So the man sat by a bush near a wall close to the sea and waited for God to speak. And God heard the man, so God answered. He sent fire, not speaking through a bush, but through the church. He brought down a wall, not a brick, but of sin. He stilled the storm, not of the sea, but of a disturbed soul. And God waited for the man to respond, and he waited and waited. But because the man was looking at bushes, not hearts and church, bricks and not lives, seas and not souls, he decided that God had done nothing. The man's eyes, ears, and mind were closed to anything other than what he wanted. He didn't understand 
what God was about. And that is a common failing across the world today. The power of the gospel is realized by those who hear its message. But we must be open to receive it and not constrained by our own preconceived ideas. Just as the reading of the word brought power of faith and unity to the ancient Jews, Jesus' teaching kindled a growing power of belief in his disciples who became the body of the church. His followers came to realize that Christianity is a living faith, open to all people who accept its message. Jesus' teaching and example unites them in their belief, regardless of their status or wherever they live. Years after Jesus' death and resurrection, Paul wrote to the growing church communities, urging them to be united in their faith. He likens the church to the human body, dependent on each part to operate well. It reminds me, if any of you were watching the rugby last night, I had to, I had to admit, because my husband was watching it. But if you watched the All Blacks and the Irish teams playing, you would have noticed teamwork. Both teams worked so well. And I'm not going to spoil it by saying who, who won if you haven't heard yet. It also reminds me of the old proverb, many hands make light work, pointing to the importance of teamwork. If we want something done quickly, then we need to cooperate and focus on the task in hand. The Amish community in the USA are renowned for their conservative way of life, fixed on traditions of the past and on the teachings of the Bible. Though we may not agree with their old-fashioned dress codes or lack of more modern facilities, most of us will admire their caring community spirit and religious commitment. They are well known for sharing responsibility. And if one of them needs a new barn built, for example, they will all gather together and build it within a week, weekend or less. Likewise, Paul urges the believers to see that they are all part of Christ's body, the church. Each person, you and me, have a gift that you can share for him. You play your part no matter how small. And that is important to keep the church functioning. He emphasizes how each of us have different gifts, some to preach, teach, heal, perform miracles, and a whole host of gifts that are important in their own way. We in the church are formed as God's people, just like the human body is formed, with all these separate bits and pieces cooperating and working together in a common fu function and purpose. And Paul points to this unity we have in Jesus and the oneness we share in God, not just here, wherever we are and wherever we meet with Christians. Just like the differences in each individual, different churches have their own role to play too. Each denomination brings its own traditions and practices that offer a rich diversity to the faith. We can still be united in the faith and keep our own style of worship, language, tempo of music, as long as we praise the same God. The important fact to remember is that each of us belong to Christ. Therefore, we must respect our differences and focus on him. The trouble is that too often we focus on our differences and forget about God 
who holds it all together with a clear instruction to love one another. Someone likened the church this way, God has enlisted us in his navy and placed us on his ship. The boat has one purpose, to carry us safely to the other shore. This isn't a cruise ship, it's a battleship. We are not called to a life of leisure, but to a life of service. Each of us has a different task. Some concerned with those who are drowning are snatching people from the water. Others are occupied with the enemy so they can, they man the canons of prayer and worship. Still others devote themselves to the crew, feeding and training new members. Though different, we are the same. Each can tell of an encounter with the captain, for each of us has been called personally. We followed, we followed him across the gangplank of grace onto the same boat. There is one captain, one destination. Though the battle is fierce, the boat is safe, for our captain is God. The, sink, the boat will not sink, for that there is no concern. Our concern today is whether we have received and acted upon that call. Have we signed up and become a working member of the crew, playing our part in Christ's mission? Or have we stowed away, remaining hidden and inactive? The gospel demands a personal response. Today, we are urged to sit up and take notice of what Jesus is saying to us. Are we listening? From time to time, each of us needs someone to wake us up from our complacency and set us on the right track. Sometimes that's a direction Sometimes that direction may, ever come, may even come from a different branch of the church. Needless to, to say, we'll find excuses. Things are fine just as they are. Or we may feel inadequate and say we're too old, too young, or not very good at anything. An elderly lady was telling me recently that she was past her sell-by date and it was time God called her home. I just, I'm just done. What can I do to help him now? She asked. She underestimated the effect she had on others because she was the type of person that cheered up anyone who was around her. As well as being good company, she was a good neighbor and she would pick up her phone and phone and speak to people that she knew were home alone. Sometimes we fail to notice the importance of being a good friend, a good listener, a good advisor, a helper, a carer, or simply the bearer of a smile, of encouragement, or thanks. We live in difficult times, even within our church circumstances. We are not sure about the future of what's going to happen. Remember Paul's encouragement for the young churches, growing up in areas he visited, to grow strong and healthy by working together as one body. The church is not a building. It's a living body, and we are part of it.
This is a fitting message for us today. Let's be united in supporting each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, the head of the church who has fulfilled God's promise. He speaks to us today. Listen. Amen and glory be to God. We sing the hymn, Brother, Sister, Let Me Serve You. We come now to our prayers of intercession when we think of the people of the world. Let us pray. Lord God, your church in every nation proclaims your glory, yet we, found our vo we find our voices weak and our efforts sometimes half-hearted. Fire us with enthusiasm to carry on your mission and grant us the ability to express its importance and relevance to the world now, just as it was in the past. Help us to find the right communication skills through words, music and activities to tune in to the lives of the young as well as adults of all ages, whether in their homes, at work, in leisure time or in church services and functions. We pray for our government and the powerful leaders of all nations. May they work relentlessly for peace and justice, providing resources to help those in their care, especially those unable to fend for themselves. In this time of discord, in many areas of the world, we remember in particular every place of conflict, where the terror of war causes great suffering, especially in Ukraine and the Holy Land at this time. We pray for peace and calm, that peacemakers bring forward solutions, promoting kindness and hope, 
and that peace will soon return. May the aid workers bringing healing and relief and all who are ill, in pain or disabled in any way be safe. May they feel your power at work within them, helping them to cope. Remove their fear and fill them with courage, assured that in your kingdom they will find wholeness of mind. We pray for the grief-stricken, aching from their invisible wounds. Ease their pain. Help them to find laughter and joy once more with new direction in their lives. May the good memories offer comfort and bring gratitude for the time they shared with loved ones now gone. May they find your blessing in their lives, kindling a stronger faith. Lord God, we ask for your blessing on the congregation here at Castle Hill and on their minister, Paul. We pray that Paul and Shirley have a good holiday and feel the benefit of their rest. As a church family, help all of them to encourage and support each other to be good servants in your church, playing their part, however small, to the best of their ability. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We sing, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Let us go out into the world and spread God's blessing and the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you all now and evermore. Amen. <laughs>